So, one day, Jesus taught his disciples how they were supposed to pray. I have to be honest, that sounds to me to be a little bit silly. I mean, really, like when you think about what prayer is, all prayer is is talking. It's just talking, except you're talking to God. And like from the age of, I actually don't know when the age is, but like from the age of, you know, like a toddler and up, you know how to talk. Most parents want their kids to learn to talk until they learn to talk, then they would love to go back. But talking is so easy that children can do it. Like, you just open your mouth and form words and sounds come out. There is nothing simpler than talking. And so there really should be nothing simpler than talking to God. Prayer is basically the easiest thing ever. And yet the truth is Jesus had to teach his disciples how to pray. Which, if nothing else, teaches us that people can be really dumb sometimes. In Jesus' day, the people had taken this incredibly simple concept— This incredibly easy thing of talking to God. And they had turned it into this ridiculous uh, competition, this sideshow, this this, uh, kind of like American Idol or The Voice. You know, like these people would, would stand on street corners and they would pray these flowery, glowing, long prayers. And they weren't, they weren't doing it because they wanted to talk to God. That wasn't their point. They were doing it because they wanted people to think they were impressive. They wanted other people to look at them and see their piety. This was a very religious society. And so they could impress other people with how religious they were in this religious world. So the longer and the better their prayers, they thought, the more people would say, ooh, ah, that guy must really be close to God. And the whole thing was just a sham. Jesus called these people hypocrites. He said they are acting. They're playing a game. And they're, they're not talking to God. They're doing this for a show. And this is in no way what God wants. And so to make sure that his disciples didn't do that themselves, Jesus taught them a model prayer for them to pray. We read about it. We read the prayer in the the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. Here's what we read. Jesus said, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's not a long prayer, but it's interesting that if you look at this, it sort of encompasses, and it makes sense that it would be a good prayer. I mean, Jesus is telling us to do it, but it kind of encompasses a large, wide span of things that we should want for God in our world, corporately, you know, communally in the, the whole world, but then also in our own individual lives. There's, there's things kind of for everybody here, and there's things that are just for us. It's a very nice prayer. And Jesus taught us, if you look at the prayer, if you think about it, if you break it down, there are essentially seven things that Jesus tells us we should be asking God for. Seven things, seven requests, petitions that we should go to God for. So if if you look at it, uh, the first petition is, is that God's name be kept holy. That's hallowed be your name. Then we should ask God that his kingdom should come. His kingdom should be here. We should ask God that his will is done here on earth just like it is in heaven. We should ask God to feed us, give us our our material needs, give us this day our daily bread. We should ask God to forgive us, knowing that we're sinners and knowing that as sinners we're called to make peace around us as we forgive others. And then we should ask God not to lead us into temptation. And we should ask God to deliver us from all evil. Some translations say the evil one, uh, but evil. Seven things that we are told that we should be asking God for. But there's a funny thing. This is very early in Jesus' ministry. This is very early in Jesus' teaching. This is very early in the New Testament. A funny thing happens when you read the rest of the New Testament. A funny thing happens when you read the rest of the Gospels. What you find is that these requests, well, they're a little strange. For example, in the same chapter, same chapter of, of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching about how we shouldn't worry about things. And he compares people to the birds of the air. He tells us that we're a lot like birds. 
This is one of Jesus' favorite illustrations, is comparing people to birds. We've talked about this before. And he says, that you look at the birds, and he says, none of them work. Like, they don't go and clock in 9 to 5 or 6 to 6. They don't work at all. They don't, they don't build barns to save things up. And yet, the birds are well fed. Because, Jesus said, God cares, and love, cares about and loves the birds. God provides for the physical needs of the birds. And so if that's how God provides for birds, how do you think he provides for you? The point, Jesus says, is that God has provided for you food. This daily bread we're called to ask for, God has already provided. So that's interesting. Here's another example. Later on, Jesus is talking to these people. And speaking of feeding, he had fed 5,000 people. He'd, you know, this is one of his most famous miracles. And afterwards, the next day, everybody came back. Because, well, if you got free food one day, you'd come back for more. And so they come back, and they want more food. And Jesus says, I'm not going to feed you food today, but I am going to teach you. And he teaches them uh, about a lot of different things. And, and one of the things he teaches them is about what God's will is. He specifically says what God's will is. And that's good because a lot of people today ask, well, what is God's will in the world or in my life? Or what is it that God wants? And in John, in the book of John, chapter 6, Jesus explains exactly what God's will is, exactly what God, God wants for our lives. Jesus said, the will of God is that you believe in me. And that by believing in me, at the last day, God will raise you up give you new life, and you will live forever. In other words, the will of God is that when we believe in Jesus, we will live eternally, which is a thing that is promised will happen in the future by the power of Jesus. That's interesting. A thing we're supposed to ask for, Jesus' promise is going to happen anyway. Another example. John the Baptist came along teaching. And his message was that the kingdom of God is near. So people were getting baptized. People were repenting. People were, were coming forward and saying, I want to be part of this kingdom. I want to be part of this because the kingdom is near. And so Jesus was one of those guys to get baptized. Jesus starts his ministry. He does his thing. And during Jesus' ministry, as we read in Luke chapter 16, 17, we read Jesus saying, the kingdom of God is among you. It's right here. It's right now. The kingdom of God is here. It's not far off in the future. It's not coming at the second coming. It's not coming, you know, when John Hagee says Russia shows up. That's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here now. It's interesting. We now have three. Three of the seven things that we're supposed to ask for, Jesus promises are already happening whether or not we ask for them. And if you're good at spotting patterns, I'll bet you a dollar you know where I'm going now. Because that's three out of seven. That means we have four left. What is left here? We have uh, forgive us our debts. The second you become a Christian, we, we talk about it in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, when you are baptized, it's for the forgiveness of sins. In the book of Romans, we read about justification, that justification means you are a forgiven person. In 1 John chapter 2, we learn that John is writing to Christians because their sins have already been forgiven. If you are a Christian, you don't need to ask God to forgive your sins. He's already done it. Every time you say, God, forgive me, he's saying, yeah, I know, I already did. Every time. So, so there's that, okay. Uh, what else do we have? Lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. God, don't tempt me to sin. Well, this is interesting because James actually says it's impossible for God to tempt us. Impossible, that's the word. Uh, God cannot tempt us. God, God is not the one that tempts us. God is the one that leads us away from sin. This idea that, that actually Paul doubles down on in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, God leads us away from temptation. Every time you and I are tempted, God gives us a way out. God is not the one who tempts us. He cannot be the one to tempt us. He's the one that leads us away from temptation. This thing we're supposed to ask for, it's already happening. And in fact, this deliver us from evil deliver us from the evil one, let's go back to 1 John chapter 2. We read that the reason John is writing is because you have won your battle with the evil one. We read in Romans chapter 6 that we are no longer slaves to sin. 
but that it is righteousness and grace that rules in our lives. We read in Hebrews chapter 2 that Jesus came and died to take away our fear of death that was given to us by Satan. Jesus is here to conquer Satan, and that was 2,000 years ago. Jesus has, Satan has done been conquered by Jesus. Already been done. And so that leaves us with God's name being holy. And if you look at the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, John sees a picture of what goes on in heaven. What's going on now, what will be going on, what is going on for eternity. And wouldn't you know it, there are angels surrounding the throne of God, singing, holy, holy, holy is the name of God. And people from all, every tribe, tongue, and people group, every type of person you can imagine, join them for eternity, lifting up God's name as different, as holy. Jesus teaches us to pray seven things. Ask God for seven things. And when you look at his teaching, when you look at the New Testament, what you learn is that all seven are all already being taken care of. Whether you ask for them or not, the truth is that God's name is holy. God's kingdom has come. God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. God has given us daily bread. God has forgiven us our debts. God cannot lead us into, tempt into temptation, and God has delivered us from evil. This whole prayer is unnecessary. Whether you pray it or not, God has done it. And I think that's pretty neat. But it also begs the question of why pray then? Why did Jesus say, pray these things? Well, the answer is this. It teaches us something not only about ourselves, not only about prayer, but also about God. You see, so often we think that prayer is us trying to get God to do what we want. If we ask in a certain way, if we say the right things, if we have the right attitude, if we have the right heart, if we, if we are the right people, we think about, you know, the prayer of a righteous man is effective. So if God doesn't answer our prayers, we wonder, well, maybe I'm not being so righteous right now. We, we, we try to figure out what it is that we can do or be or, or whatever so that God will do what we want. And I got to tell you, that is just the, the, the worst way to pray. Like I said, people can be real dumb sometimes. And that is just the worst way to pray. Prayer is not about us getting God to do what we want. Prayer is about us getting our will and aligning it with God's will. When we ask God for these seven things, we're actually just naming seven things God has done in our world and in our lives. We're just naming them and saying, God, this is what you've already done. When we realize that, we realize who God is. The, when we pray to God, we're not praying to a being that we need to manipulate into blessing us. We're praying to a being who already knows what we need and is already providing it, whether or not we can get the words right or not. God is not waiting for you to pray to bless you. That's not it at all. When you pray, that's when you realize God has already blessed you. Because God doesn't wait around and say, man... If only they would ask, you know, they never asked. Like, you're like your parents, and like, you know, you, you don't feed your kids. Well, the kid didn't ask for food. I was gonna, but, you know, kids starved to death because they never asked. You think of how silly that would be. That's not a loving parent. And I dare say, God is a better parent than you are. So God isn't sitting around waiting for us. That's not the way God is. When we recognize how good God is, how beautiful God is, we see God's already anticipating our needs. He's already loving us whether or not we ask. By the way, as a sidebar, if you'd like to know a great uh, understanding in one concept of what the gospel of Christ is, it's in this. Okay? People in Jesus' day were so ridiculous that the act of talking out loud to God became something they sinned with. Like, if you mess that up, there is nothing you won't mess up. Like, talking out loud to God should be bare minimum bar to clear that a competent human can do. And they mess it up. And so Jesus says, okay, well, <laughs> that's how bad at life you are. And then he explains prayer. And he doesn't just say, do better. Instead, he says, by the way, God wasn't waiting for you to get it right in the first place. He already loved you. He already blessed you. He already provided for you everything you needed in the first place. 
God responds to our idiocy with love and grace and compassion and mercy. God responds to our incompetence with the greatest, greatest gifts that we could possibly imagine. And that's why Christianity is cool. So I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this passage this week. Because we've been talking, I don't know if you guys, if you guys the first week in a while, this, uh, we've been talking about the parables. We've been talking about uh, the parables from kind of a specific point of view, kind of a specific vantage point. For the last month or so, we've been looking at uh, um, how Jesus' first audience, the ancient Jewish people living in the first century, how they would have heard the parables, and how that's different than how we hear them, and how when we factor in how they heard them with the way that we hear them, it adds kind of a depth and a, a new way to understand these. And so this week, as I was looking at the, the, the parable we're going to read here in a second, I was thinking about the way that God is and the way we get God wrong so often. Because so often we think, okay, the kingdom of God is about us asking God to do what we want him to do. The kingdom of God is about our will. It's about our agenda. It's about what we believe. It's about what we think is right. It's about what we want God to do in the world. So we tell him, God, I want you to do this. And then we get angry when he doesn't do it. So often we think that's the way it's supposed to be. And yet, one of Jesus' most famous parables cuts against the grain and teaches the exact opposite of that. And we read it, we could read it in one of three different sections. We're actually going to read it in the Gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 13, here is what we read. Jesus says the kingdom is like. So Jesus was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Now, a couple things of note we need to understand, first and foremost, right off the top. You've probably heard that passage a couple different ways, and the reason is we read it three different places in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all thought this was incredibly important and important enough to include it in their gospel, which is interesting. When you understand the way that these things are formed, you usually don't have three or even four uh, recordings of the same story because sort of at a certain point they said, well, if he wrote it down, I don't need to. <laughs> and so there's, there's, a, there's not a lot that's repeated. So if something is repeated, we can basically guess that there's something very important here that we can, we're supposed to understand. And this is even greater or more important or more significant than even other gospel stories because outside of the Bible, there's other stories, other books written about Jesus that were not by the apostles. We don't think were inspired. They weren't. They were just written because Jesus was a famous guy. And in those, this story is written too. Essentially, if you were to jump in a time machine and go back in time, any time in the first century, any time in the second century, any time in the third century, and said, hey, somebody explain to me the teachings of Jesus, they're going to include the parable of the mustard seed. This short little phrase, this short little illustration. And that actually gives us a distinct advantage in seeing how the original audience, and really us, should understand this parable. Because here's the deal. It, it stands to reason that Jesus, if it's written down all these places, Jesus probably told this story in different ways in different times. That's why Luke puts it in one place in his, in his gospel, Matthew in another, Mark in another. It, they're different places, which means Jesus told this again and again. He would go to different places. By the way, this is something we should probably put in our back pocket anyway. Jesus would have told the same sermons again and again because they didn't have the internet. They didn't have like a recording. So in one town, if he says the Sermon on the Mount... Uh, he goes up to the road 10 miles, and they haven't heard it yet. And there, it's not like on like a MP3 they can just hit play on. So he just has to say it again. So Jesus is saying the same stuff over and over and over and over and over. So the beauty of that is when we have multiple renderings of those passages, we can see what Jesus includes every time, and we can see what Jesus cuts. Because here's the thing. If I'm telling you a story three, four, five, six times, I'm going to tell it differently because, well, I'm a person, and sometimes I have different details, and sometimes maybe the third time in, I think, oh, this is a better way of saying this. But if the message is the same, the core of what's at the center of all of them, what's included in all of them, will remain the same. So we have three different tellings of the mustard seed parable, and there's some things that are in all of them and some things that are not, and we want to focus on what's in all of them. So a couple of details get cut immediately. Very often when we look at this parable, we look at Jesus saying that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. Well, as we read in Luke, Jesus didn't say that. That's not there. 
It's in two of them, but not the other one. So if Jesus can tell this story without saying it's the smallest of all seeds, then it being the smallest of all seeds is not the point. There's also the, the matter of a man sowing the seed in, in the dirt. In some renderings, Jesus uh, says a man did it. Sometimes it just says the seed just happened to be there. Okay. In some renderings, the birds show up and they make their nests on the branches. And in some of them, they just don't. They're in the shadow of the branches. Clearly, the branches in the shadow doesn't mean a whole lot because it can change each part of the story. So we're not looking at those details. We should not look at those details uh, because there were times Jesus told the story without including them. We also probably should not talk a lot about this being a mustard seed instead of just a seed. And here's why. Even though Jesus said mustard seed every time, if you would go in your, in your Bible and you go to a search for the word mustard, what you're going to find is that Jesus is the only guy ever in the Bible who says anything about mustard. I don't know if he just really liked it. Like Jesus gets a turkey sandwich. He doesn't want mayo. He wants mustard. I don't know if that's what the, But, but th there, that, that Jesus talks about mustard a couple different ways in a couple different contexts for a couple different reasons, but no one else does. There's been a lot written over the last couple thousand years about the significance of mustard in an ancient culture. And here's what you need to understand. Every one of those things was written after Jesus. And that doesn't help us to understand what the people before Jesus thought. So I think it's sort of like this. If I told you, hey guys, I I'm going to go buy a bag of peanuts. You'd say, oh, okay, cool. Drew must like peanuts. Maybe he's going to a baseball game and prefers it over Cracker Jack. Do, you wouldn't say, but Drew, what is the significance of peanuts? Why, why not an almond? Why not a pecan? Then you have pecan sandies. Pecan sa anyway, anyway. You would just say Drew is eating peanuts because he wanted a nut, and there it is. So if we cut all of that out, if we cut all of that out, if we say, okay, the stuff that's only in uh, all of them is what we're focusing on, and the mustard thing, they would not have read into. Whether we should or not is a whole other conversation, but they would not have, because Jesus is the first guy to do it. What are we left with? What story are we left with? What illustration? What parable is here? And what we're left with is this. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a seed in the earth that grows. And when it grows, it provides a home for the birds of the air. The kingdom of heaven, let me say that again, the kingdom of heaven is like a seed that's in the ground and grows. And when it's finished growing, the birds of the air come and find a home in it. Now, Jesus, we already have talked about this morning in Matthew chapter 6, he does it a couple other times as well, Jesus loves to compare people to birds. So I'm just going to let Jesus interpret Jesus. If Jesus says that birds are like people, I'm going to say that's just what Jesus is talking about when he talks about birds. Birds are like people. Cool. So the birds of the air part, that is people. You and I should see us in this story. So the question is, what about the seed? What significance is there in the seed? And that's where things begin to get very interesting. Because an ancient Jewish person, an ancient Hebrew, would see the natural world in a very specific way. It's very different. Than this. There's a lot of ways that the ancient people saw the world. I mean, they saw a three-tiered universe, you know, where heaven is above us and Hades or the place of the dead is below us and here on earth. They saw them as the center of the earth, which is flat, as the center of the universe. I mean, they, they had a lot, of, a lot of interesting things in the natural world. Their assumptions about the way the world is very different than ours. But one assumption they, they did have that I think is really solid that we should understand is the way they see God creating. If you read the book of Genesis, chapter 1, when God creates things, he does not create anything to stay like it is. He never creates anything that's static. He never creates anything that just sits there. It's not the way it works. When, when God creates people, for example, he says, be fruitful and multiply. He created beings, you and I, that are supposed to make more beings that look like you and I. When God makes the fish or the birds or the beasts of land, he makes them and says, be fruitful and multiply. I want them to make more. God makes things that make things, in other words. And that's true when it comes to plants. God did not make a plant or a tree 
that just sits there. Instead, he made seed-bearing trees and seed-bearing plants. To the Hebrews, the concept of a seed, then, is something that is life-giving. It's something that produces more and more and more life. And here's a big part. It does it without our help. In Genesis, the trees do not need Adam and Eve to do anything so that they'll make more trees. The trees are seed-bearing on their own. They make their own stuff. If you leave a tree alone, it does its own thing and makes more trees. It's the way it works. The natural world, by the way, a really great way of us looking at the natural world. The natural world, if we just leave it alone, is just fine. If we just let it go, do its thing, we don't touch it, man, will the world get along just fine. And the Hebrew people understood this. It was part of their, uh, their creation story. It was part of their roots, their foundation, which is that when God made trees, God made plants and bushes and all the different things, he made them seed-bearing. On their own, they create more life. And so the kingdom of heaven is like that seed that creates more life without our help. Put the two things together. And Jesus was saying the kingdom of heaven is like a seed that grows without your intervention, without your will, without your plan, without you coming along and doing anything. But when it's done growing, it invites you to come find a home in its branches, under its branches, in its presence. The kingdom of God does what it does apart from our performance, apart from us doing anything. The kingdom of God is truly the kingdom of God because whether or not we're a part of it, it is doing its thing. And then we, like the birds of the air, are invited to come along. Here's what we need to understand. God's kingdom does not need you. God's kingdom does not need me. God's kingdom does just fine without us. Because it's the kingdom not of you and not of me, not of the church, not of Christianity, not of our religion, not of people, but is the kingdom of God. It's his. It'll do just fine without us. And yet we are invited to find a home in it. Again, not part of our effort or our performance or our ability to jump through hoops or our ability to earn it. It's not about that at all. Now, here's why this is vastly, vastly more important than we usually talk about. If we get that twisted, we will mess everything up. If we don't recognize offhand from the start that this is God's and God's alone, and that we are just along for the ride as his partners here, we're his sidekicks at best doing what he wants. If we don't get that right, we will mess everything up. In the first century church, there is a, a place called Corinth. And they had everything. We read about how incredible this church is. They have wealth. They have giftedness. They understand the scriptures in a way nobody else does. They understand Jesus in a way nobody else does. They have all sorts of preachers and teachers and people from all over the ancient world. And yet, they could not get along with one another. Every, I mean, they mess up everything. They are worse than the people who can't figure out how to pray. Because they are just messing everything up. And the Apostle Paul writes to them, and he writes to them that part of their problem is that they are not thinking about things in terms of whose kingdom this is. And so the people are saying, well, I belong to Peter, as if it was the kingdom of Peter. Well, I belong to Apollos, the greatest preacher in the first century, as if it was the kingdom of Apollos, the greatest preacher of the first century. Well, I belong to Paul, as if uh, it was the kingdom of Paul. And what they were doing was not only lifting themselves up and putting their own agendas and desires at the forefront, but they were also excluding others while they did it. And so that was a little silly, but it was also horribly, heinously toxic. And so Paul wrote to them. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Here's what we read. Paul says, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believed in the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. <laughs> We're his sidekicks. I planted the seed in your hearts. Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planning or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. 
Paul says this is the kingdom of God. This is his. It's not my kingdom. It's not your kingdom. It is God's kingdom. And when you see it like that, and when we understand the parable that brings the birds along, no one is excluded here. You see, when we make our kingdoms, people get excluded because we put forward our desires, our ideas, our beliefs, our politics, our religion, our denomination, the way we were raised, the way we look at the world. When we put together, put forward our kingdom, other people get left out. And yet the God who made everyone in his image, who became a man who died on the cross for everybody, who sent his spirit, who fills everybody, wants no one excluded, wants no one left out. And so at the end of the day, it's not our job to put forward our anything because the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God. It's his. It is like a seed in the ground that grows on its own. Genesis chapter 1, the seeds are, the, the trees are seed bearing. They make more without our intervention. intervention. The kingdom of God does its thing whether or not you or I ever have a part in it. It's not about us. It's about God. And God's kingdom is the sort of kingdom that invites all the birds of the air to come. And so as we look at this story, it's a challenge for us to lay down our agendas and take up God's. And it's a beautiful, I think, comfort to us to say you don't have to perform. It doesn't, you don't have to get these things right. Oh, you're right? Congratulations. It didn't matter in the first place if you were. You're wrong? Oh, who cares? It doesn't matter. That's not what this is about. This is about the work and will of God. Not yours and not mine. This morning, on our fifth week of our series called The Stories of Rabbi Jesus. And as we look at these things, a new, uh, I think we're learning some new stuff. I'm having a good time with this. Our fifth lesson from the stories of Rabbi Jesus, his parables, is this. That God and God alone builds his kingdom. And God and God alone provides all that we need through it. Sometimes, this is really hard, we're like the Corinthians. We think oh, that's what I am, and we put, we put forward our will, and we say, well, so we want these sorts of people around, and, and, and here's what we need to remember every time that happens. We need to remember that people are so stupid that the act of talking out loud to God became a massive point of contention. I know it sounds like I'm being insulting. I'm insulting myself here, too. We have taken the simplest concept, talking out loud to God, and turned it into this massive thing that we can send. We become hypocrites with talking out loud to God. We are terrible at so much of life. It makes sense that God would say, well, if I'm going to have a kingdom, it's not going to be a kingdom of them. They are terrible. They won't grow it right. It makes sense that God would not want maybe our ideas about how he builds a kingdom. But what's beautiful What's beautiful, what's incredible, is God doesn't say, well, y'all are so terrible, I don't want you in the kingdom. Instead, God doesn't just say, oh, I'm not going to use your ideas, I'm going to give you the blueprint and you build the kingdom. That's not what God does. God, in his grace and mercy and compassion and understanding for us, builds the kingdom himself. And then invites us to find a home in it. If you hear nothing else, here's what I want you to hear. Relax. Seriously, relax. We are so beside ourselves trying to earn God's love and affection. So much of religion is how do I get God to not be mad at me or anymore? Or how do I? And everything Jesus taught, the kingdom of God is about a God who does this on his own apart from us. Relax. God is not mad at you. God is not asking for you to jump through a hoop. God is not saying, do this, then I'll accept you. God is not saying, recite all these prayers, and then I'll forgive you. Relax. Because when we pray to God, what we ask of him, even when they're the things Jesus wanted us to ask, they're things God is already doing. Which is sort of hilarious when you think about it. Jesus was hysterical 
relax. The kingdom of God is not about you. It is the kingdom of God for you. The kingdom is like a seed. On its own, it grows. It turns into a tree. And the birds of the air, you and me and everyone else, are invited to find peace and comfort and a home. That's what God wants. And that's what God offers. So when the musicians are done for, they're going to sing a song. We offer an invitation each and every week to take God up on this. It is in no way, it is not a contradiction what I just said. It is not a jump through this hoop and then things are fine. No, repentance and baptism and accepting Christ and all this, this is simply uh, a response to what God has already done. As we respond and we say, I, I embrace this truth you've already told about me. I'll be baptized. I'll turn my back on who used to be. I'll do things your way. The Bible teaches that's exactly what happens. If you've never made a decision like that, we've got a nice warm basket. We've got all sorts of people who can do it. Let's talk. If you're an immersed believer in Christ, looking for a perfect church home, this place is not it. But we do serve a perfect God. We want to connect. We want to call. We want to cultivate. We want to meet new people. We want to share the gospel. We want to grow up while we do it. But most of all, we want to recognize that the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God. It is his. And we are invited to be his partners. We are invited to be his sidekicks. We are Robin at best. And that is beautiful because we can now relax as we stand and as we sing.